guys. I uh, hope everyone's doing well tonight. And I hope you got to listen to the in-crew quads. Wasn't that interesting? Uh, but beautiful music. Uh, just awesome music. All creatures of our God and King. Just powerful. What a wonderful, uh, what a wonderful song for tonight. But uh, tonight we're going to continue our discussion of God's creation. And we'll be looking at both Genesis chapters 1 and 2 as inspired by God and as written by Moses. But uh, let me open this in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we join together tonight with grateful hearts. Lord, we're, we're overwhelmed and just simply unable to comprehend your love for us, that you would create us in your image. Lord, we pray that you will grow us and make us strong and courageous servants for your glory. And Lord, the words that are spoken here tonight, we pray that those will be your words and that those words will trans transform us for your purpose. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Guys, as you remember from our discussion last week, infinite, eternal, and sovereign God had spoken creation into being. And uh, our uncreated and unique God had that big inning as you remember, and he created the heavens and the earth. God brought order out of chaos, and at his command, there was light, day, night, sky, land, seas, seed-bearing plants, sun, moon, stars, creatures of the sea, birds of the air, livestock, creatures that move on the ground, and wild animals. All of that came to exist on days one through six. As God said, and it was so, and it was all good. And as we went through that study last week, some of us may have been wondering, well, why didn't Moses tell us about this or that? Why didn't he give more detail about this or that? Well, remember that this is Elohim's story. Moses may be the writer, but he's not the author. God is dictating for Moses what the people of Israel and what you and I need to know to grow in our faith, our hope, and our trust. And to be sure, we have not finished God's story. Now, remember last week, we didn't finish the sixth day. We saw that God created the animals, and God saw that that was good. Remember, when we finished last week, we had not read the words, there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. As you know, the rest of the sixth day is a pretty big deal for you and me. And the sixth day is a pretty big deal for Elohim, too. Big enough to need another chapter of remarkable details for Elohim's creation of mankind, creation of you and me. And as we complete our discussion of Elohim's good work on day six, we'll also be looking at the details of God's preparation for his special plan and provision for mankind in the details God provided to Moses as recorded in chapter two. And since we're going to be discussing chapter two, um, with these, with these together with these final verses of chapter one, we need to cover some background on chapter two, verses four and following. Turn to Genesis 2, 4. I'll give you a moment to do that. See where it begins. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. See that? Some Old Testament scholars have claimed that this section of chapter 2 is a second account of creation written by someone other than Moses, and that this account in chapter 2 conflicts with the creation account of chapter 1. That theory is not widely accepted. We see in chapter 2 that Moses records the same creation story with additional detail God provides so that Israel and you and me will be able to understand events that take place later in Genesis. 
we'll see the significance and the necessity of those additional creation details as we continue our Genesis study tonight as well. Also, keep in mind that unlike chapter one, chapter two is not necessarily linear or chronological. We'll see that as we insert the details of chapter two into the chronology of chapter one. And so uh, look for those verses from chapter two as we plug those into chapter one during our discussion tonight. So with that background, let's begin our first division, which should not come as a surprise to you. Our first division is God creates mankind. And for that division, we're looking at chapter one, verses 26 through 31, and chapter two, verses four through 25. And you get, you've got that outline with the email that you received with the link to this lecture. Um, in a study of God's creation of mankind, we see God's image, God's provision, God's instruction, and God's gift. Let me restate that. As we talk about God's creation of mankind tonight, we're going to be looking at God's image, God's provision, God's instruction, and God's gift. Those will make up our first division tonight. So our first section uh, for this first division is God's image. And we're going to be looking at chapter 1, verse 26, chapter 2, verse 7. Okay, chapter 1, verse 26. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. We get the picture of Elohim, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit having this divine deliberation about the creation of man. Let's make mankind in our image. Now, pulling some of the additional detail from chapter 2, verse 7, then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. This is where we get the concept of Adam, meaning taken out of the ground. And though Adam may be dust, he's literally formed by God like a potter, carefully molding the clay with focused attention on each precise detail of this creation. Truly God's artwork. Truly God's creation. Breathing the breath of life into Adam is God's life-giving spirit. James 2.26 reminds us that the body without the spirit is dead. Remember from chapter 1, verse 24, also on the sixth day, Elohim said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds. Elohim had already created living creatures, animals from the dust. But clearly creating mankind from the dust on the sixth day was not the same as creating the animals. Humans and animals are different. No matter how intelligent the animal may be or how much they're taught, they're not endowed with the image of God. God did not breathe the spirit of life into the animals. Man is truly a distinct creation. Being created in the image of God, we're able to have a very special relationship with him. He not only gave us personality, minds to think with, emotions to feel with, and wills for making decisions, God also gave us an inner spiritual nature that enables us to know him and to worship him. So know this, guys. You're here on purpose. You're not an accident or the coincidence of random chaos. God made you intentionally for a reason. You are the greatest miracle that you know. Your body consists of 206 bones wrapped with 650 muscles and seven miles of nerve fibers. Your eyes possess 100 million receptors and your ears 24,000 fibers. Your heart beats 36 million times every year and sends blood pumping through more than 60,000 miles of veins, arteries, and tubing. Your brain contains 13 billion nerve cells. 
Picture the possible number of interconnections in your brain this way. The number of atoms in the universe is one followed by 100 zeros. The number of different patterns possible in your brain is one followed by over 800 zeros. In your unconscious brain database, that which your unconscious brain knows and stores outweighs your conscious brain on an order exceeding 10 million to one. You literally cannot imagine how remarkable you are. You and I are fearfully and wonderfully made. We're made in God's image. Now our second section of this first division is God's provision. And uh, once again, just as a reminder, we're weaving these verses of detail of creation from chapter two into the chronology of chapter one. Now guys, when I was 28 years old, Lana, my wife and I were expecting our first child. And I repeat, first child. I was a novice at this. I naively thought that we had some pretty routine months ahead before the celebration of our son's arrival, but I had no clue. You know, in law school, I'd heard the words preparation, preparation, preparation drilled into me over and over, but nothing could have prepared me for this. Instead of golf or other fatherhood preparing activities, my Saturdays were spent inspecting cribs, rock, rockers, baby beds, and test driving strollers. I spent evenings painting and wallpapering with the perfect color combinations. When I wasn't painting or papering, I was attending classes to learn to properly breathe into a paper sack. No detail was missed. Her mantra was perfection, perfection, perfection. And as I eventually learned, it was all for good reason. The long anticipated day was glorious. It's often celebrated and never forgotten. And guys, when I reread chapters one and two together, this truly is God's creation to perfection. But he did it with you and me in mind. That's overwhelming. His preparation was so perfect in only ways that he can know. And thankfully, God inspired Moses to give us some of those details in chapter two. Now, looking at chapter 2, verses 5 and 6, turn there. Now, at this point, no shrub had yet appeared on earth. No plant had yet sprung up. For the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no one to work the ground. But streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. And at verses 8 to 10, now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden. God planted that. And there he put man that he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. And then at uh, verses 15 to 17, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. And the Lord commanded the man, you're free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And then at verse 29 of chapter 1, then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. On Friday morning at leaders meeting, one of our leaders asked, if this plant for food stuff meant mankind was to be vegan? Well, Nick, the answer is yes. And as to mankind and to animals, being vegetarian at least, until after the flood. So it, it may appear that Noah had something to look forward to after that flood. But guys, Psalm 115, 16 sums up God's provision for mankind pretty well. It says, the highest heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth he has given to mankind. And you know, God continued his preparation for us. All of the Old Testament points to our Messiah. 
Remember, Jesus, the Messiah, assures us, do not let your hearts be troubled. I'm going to prepare a place for you, John 14. Now, along with his gift of provision, God's made, he, he makes his expectations for Adam and for us clear. Our next section in this first division is God's instruction. And continue to look and appreciate the details of chapter two as they help us understand what's going on on the sixth day in chapter one. Now, God is clear in giving mankind authority over the earth. At verse 26, he says, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over the livestock and over all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. And at verse 28, chapter one, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and every living creature that moves on the ground. And guys, we cannot honor the God of creation if we dishonor his creation. God makes his expectations and his instructions clear that we be good stewards. Now, chapter 2, verse 15, you know, we go back to God putting... Adam in the garden to work it and take care of it. And then we get, we get that instruction again. He's free to eat from any tree in the garden, but he must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will certainly die. And we're going to have more of that, more on that issue next week. And at verse 19 of chapter 2, now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and the birds of the sky, and he brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and the wild animals. Guys, we're stewards of God's creation, those blessings, and should use his gifts as he commands. And someday we want to be able to stand before God and say, as Christ has said, I have glorified you on earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. John 17, 4. You know, Adam's life was pretty cool. He was an only child, had naming rights to all the animals, and God had already planted the garden for him. But something was missing. And toward the close of the sixth day, God knew his work was not complete. Mankind was not complete. Our last section of this first division is God's gift. Now, at verse 18 of chapter 2, the Lord God said, It's not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. In verses 21 and 22, so the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib that he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. And that, that gives so much meaning to us at verse 27, chapter 1. When we read again that God created mankind in his own image, in the image of God, he created them male and female. He created him, created them. There's no ambiguity, no confusion. He created them male and female. He created them. Bible commentator Matthew Henry wrote, she was not made out of his head to rule over him nor out of his feet to be trampled upon by him, but out of his side to be equal with him, under his arm to be protected, and near his heart to be beloved. At verses 23 and 24 of chapter 2, prompted by God, these may be Adam's wedding vows that we read in these verses. This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman, 
for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and, he, and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. You know, in reading that, it just uh, makes me convinced that God and Adam had previous conversations about the in-law situation that may be yet to come. And clearly Adam took God's advice. But all of this gives us a clearer understanding to a passage we studied last year in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 7, where the Apostle Paul told us, the woman is the glory of man. And Warren Wiersbe points us to 1 Corinthians 11 and Ephesians 5, saying that if man is the head, then woman is the crown that honors his head. And in Hebrews 13, 4 and Revelation 22, 15, we see that despite what society may promote or condone, marriage is to be honored by all. God had the first word, and God will have the last word. His plan was and is one flesh for one lifetime. Martin Luther is quoted as saying, marriage is a school for character. And guys, I have to admit, that's where I get my most intense training. And you probably, probably too, you do too, or, or you will. But uh, so with Adam's crown now in place, at chapter one, verse 31, God saw all that he had made, all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. The principle for this first division, God created mankind for his glory. And the application for us, how do you daily live to glorify God's image given to you? How do I daily live to glorify God's image given to me? Guys, it's all pretty clear, isn't it? It's all pretty simple. Why can't we do simple? We'll learn why we can't do simple next week. But having completed the sixth day when God recognized all that he had created was very good, the seventh day has arrived. And that brings us to our second division, God rests, chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it, he rested from all work of creating that he had done. Now, the word Sabbath is not found in these verses, but that's what Moses is writing about, the seventh day of the week. Sabbath comes from the Hebrew word Shabbat, which means to cease working or to rest. And it's also related to the Hebrew word for seven. And there are several interesting concepts about this that we need to understand. The first one is that Isaiah 40 verse 28 tells us that God does not grow weary from his work. So he wasn't resting because he was tired. And the second concept, this seventh day doesn't have an evening and morning. So it likely doesn't end. And then the third concept, God blessed and sanctified this day for his, his own purposes, for his. Now the spiritual Sabbath of the Christian believer is found in Hebrews 4, verses 1 through 11, where the writer brings together God's creation rest and Israel's promised land rest to teach us about the spiritual rest we find in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.17 tells us that when we trust in Jesus, we enter into his spiritual rest and we are reconciled to our creator. The old is gone and the new is here. Remember, we're made in God's image. 
Unfortunately, it's been said that most people in our world are being crucified between two thieves, the regrets of yesterday and the worries about tomorrow. Those two thieves rob us of our joy today. Where did we lose ourselves in God's likeness? Most importantly for us is to dedicate that consistent time in our lives for spiritual renewal, spiritual growth, and fellowship. The true rest may cost you something, may cost me something. It may cost us time, worldly influence, pride, wealth, self-dependence, power, popularity, and the list goes on. But we must cease from our own works and find rest in the presence of our Savior. Guys, have you counted the cost of your striving? Have you counted the cost of your striving? The principle for this division is true rest is found in fellowship with our Savior. True rest is found in fellowship with our Savior. In the application, where are you sacrificing in your striving? Where are you sacrificing in your striving? A famous foreign scholar came to a prestigious university to lecture. His university host met him at the subway station. The host said to the scholar, if we run and catch the next train, we'll, we'll save ourselves three minutes. The scholar quietly asked, and what significant thing shall we do with the three minutes we save by running? And finally, Augustine is said to have written, Thou hast made us for thyself, and our hearts are restless until they rest in thee. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the blessing of this fellowship, Lord, and we just thank you for loving us enough to create us in your image to provide us provide for us with such detail and care and love and compassion and to give us instruction on how we should live lord and then also lord to give us the gift of male and female in our lives so that as men and women we will have companionship that brings honor and glory to you. And Lord, we thank you for the instruction on rest. And we pray, Lord, that we can take our eyes off the things of this world and focus them on you. And Lord, we pray that you will continue to grow your spirit within us and transform us in all things for your glory. It's in your son's holy name we pray. Amen. Good night, guys.